Hallelujah. The word declares that he inhabits the praises of his people. So we lift up praises.
Never repay you, Lord, for all you've done for me. How you lose my shackles and you set me free. How you made a way when there was no way. How you turned my midnights 
Um, over the next few weeks, I, I want to talk to you about uh, an aspect of uh, the scriptures that we need to think carefully about and expand or deepen our knowledge of. One of the things that I recognize, not only about the Bible, but just life in general, is that um, when we have principles without understanding the root foundation and motivations of those principles, we lose context, and we can have misperceptions about the very principles that we're looking at. Uh, if you have godly principles that are laid out before us, but we don't understand God's motivation behind those principles, we can lose perception and, and have a, a misconception of the very principles that we're trying to walk by. Uh, here, here's, a, here's an example. Um, you know, I have a 16-year-old daughter who is a new driver. She has a car. She has a job now. And, uh, you know, she's kind of doing her thing. And if I were to say to her, hey, you know what? 10 o'clock p.m. is the time that I want you in the house. I don't want you driving anywhere past 10. Well, that principle in itself is a fine principle. But from that principle, if she does not know the motivation behind the setting of that principle, she could interpret that principle and perceive it in a number of different ways. She could think, well, my dad doesn't want me driving after 10 because he thinks I'm irresponsible. Or my dad doesn't want me driving after 10 because he doesn't trust me. Or my dad doesn't want me driving after 10 because he thinks I can't drive. Any of those perceptions could be something that she comes away from looking at that principle. You can't drive after 10. In reality, that principle really comes from the fact that I care for my daughter. It comes from the fact that I also recognize that there are a number of things that could happen after 10 with a young lady driving. I mean, anything from drunk driving, which happens generally late in the, late in the night, to her being stranded because the car broke down and here she is by herself, a young lady in a potentially dangerous situation. So principles without understanding the motivation behind the principles can often lead to misconceptions. And this is why we have a number of believers who walk out and live out their salvation always in a state of conflict about one thing or another from the world around them to their very relationship with God. I know I'm not the only believer who has at times thought that God was mad at them for one thing or another. Yeah. I didn't pray today. Oh, God must be mad. <laughs> I didn't read the Bible today. Oh, the Lord is mad at me. I think about this passage in, in Colossians. Um, and uh, I recognize that Paul, in this first chapter of Colossians, is laying out something. Before I get to that, well, yeah, I'll go with that. Um, 
Paul is laying out something in this first chapter of Colossians. Just before he gets to where we're going to start in verse number 15, um, he talks about praying that they would grow in knowledge, praying that they would grow in a knowledge of God. And I want you to understand something about the church at Colossae and Paul. Colossians or the the Colossians church is one of the few churches that we read about in the New Testament scriptures that Paul did not plant himself. He didn't start that church. Paul only heard about the Colossians. He heard about their faith. He heard that they were growing believers and that they loved Jesus. He heard about them. He got that report and decided that he would write them a letter because he had heard about their love for the Lord. And so he writes this letter to them and he begins to talk about their knowledge of God. That's the first thing he talks about. He's saying, listen, I want, I've been praying for you. In fact, he says, since the day I heard about you, I've been praying for you, praying that you would grow in this knowledge of God. And that knowledge is crucial, but I think also knowledge around specific areas we have to have because there are certain aspects of the knowledge of God that will help to bring us more comfort than we could ever imagine. So, for instance, Paul says in Philippians chapter 2 and verse number 1, He says, if you have any encouragement from being united with Christ and any comfort from his love. Comfort from his love. Are you in an uncomfortable situation? Is there anything going on in your life right now that's uncomfortable? Could your knowledge of God's love change your perspective about the situation you're in right now. Knowing what we know about God, everything that we know about him, because there are some things that we are clearly not in dispute about. We're not in dispute about God's sovereign power. We're not in dispute about the fact that God can do all things, anything. We're not in dispute about that. We're not in dispute about his knowledge, the fact that he knows all things, right? But sometimes we're not so sure when it comes to his love. (laughs) Sometimes we don't know how to perceive that, how to read that, how to feel that. Where do we where do we where do we get that sense of love? And that's why many of us can have a great deal of doctrinal knowledge, but still have issues Uh, where we're uncomfortable in certain situations, where our faith is not what it needs to be in certain situations, because the one piece that's missing is our understanding of God's love. And his love is the motivation for all things. So listen, we look at the godly, we look at God's principles in the scriptures. There's some of that stuff we look at, and some of us are uncomfortable with some of the stuff. Because we look at it and we're like, oh, does God really want that? Does God really need that? Is God really saying that I have to stop doing this? Is God really saying that this part of my life bothers him? Like we look at the principles of God and sometimes we see rules and regulations and boundaries. (laughs) And if we're not clear on the motivation for those things, then we can misperceive them. Yeah. What I want to do over these next couple of weeks is I want to just give you some perspectives on God's love, different perspectives. This week, I want you to come away from this service understanding that God has always loved you, and that has implications, the fact that he has always loved you. Different from the fact that God will always love you, that has separate implications, and different from the fact that God loves you right now, as you are, with all your struggles and all your issues. Different. That's a different implication. These degrees of time and how God's love is consistent through all of them say different things to us. And over these next few weeks, I want us to understand that. But for now, I want us to understand that God has always loved us. I want you to look at Colossians 1.15. God has always loved you. Even before you took your first breath, God loved you. 
Even before he laid the foundations of the world, he loved you. Colossians 1.15 says, The Son is the image of the invisible God, the firstborn over all creation. For in him, if you're using a paper Bible or you can highlight that or underline it, underline in him. For in him all things were created. All things. Things in heaven and on earth, visible and invisible, whether thrones or powers or rulers or authorities, all things have been created through him. If you can underline that or highlight that, do that. Through him. And, and this is most important for us today, for him. <sighs> See, the communicative intent of this text for the Apostle Paul is not just the supremacy of Christ. That's primary. In fact, if you're using an NIV, it'll say that in that section. It'll say the supremacy of Christ. But the communicative intent of this for Paul is not just to explain or establish the supremacy of Christ. It's also for you to look at this text, to look at where it says that all things have been created for him, or rather by him, through him, and for him, and to see yourself as a part of that creative narrative that's being explained there. That if all things were created, that includes you. That if all things were created in him, that includes you. Through him, that includes you. And for him, that includes you. Yeah. For him. Um, Oh wow! You know Amazon is is Amazon is big. Uh, how many of you guys order stuff from Amazon? I mean, I, just about everybody orders some stuff from Amazon. Amen. Amazon has become such a huge part of our lives. Being a child born in the '70s, um, having my heyday in the '80s and '90s, Amazon is like that's brand new. That's like. Just life wasn't like that <laughs> before. And one of the interesting things about Amazon is that you have to wait for your stuff. In fact, if I can find something for a decent price, even if it's a little bit more than Amazon sells it for, but I can go and pick it up, I'll do that. Because I'd like to have my stuff now. <laughs> right? Like my stuff now. Um, but one of the things that Amazon does, and it's interesting that we live in an age that we would call a microwave age. We have everybody wants their stuff right now. And we look at the fact that we have this, you know, this connection uh, globally where we can access information now. Like we are a now generation, but Amazon has forced us to wait. It's interesting. Amazon is teaching patience in an information microwave age. So one of the things I hate the most is when I have to order something from Amazon that I can't get two-day mail. Like, that's hurtful. Like, I want it now. But many of you may, may share in this. There are times where you order something from Amazon that you really, really want. It's not something that, you know, you'll get it in a well, you know. There are times where you order something from Amazon that you've really, really wanted and you're expecting it. You're waiting for it. And you have this expectation on the inside, like, I can't wait for this thing to get here. So now I want to I challenge you. I, wanna, I want you to think about this. Um, cosmologists believe that the Earth is 13.8 billion years old. Cosmologists are scientists who study the origins of the universe. They believe that the universe, sorry, not the earth, I hope I didn't say that, but the universe is 13.8 billion years old. Now, we know that cosmologists and theologists, those, the, and we know that cosmology and theology have not always agreed and do not agree on the age of the universe. But I want you to just, let's just entertain this. Just since cosmologists have attempted to quantify it, let's just entertain this thought. Let's say the universe is 13.8 billion years old. What Paul is communicating to us here, that we were created for him, 
He's communicating that more than 13.8 billion years ago, God was waiting with an expectation and an anticipation for you. And I want you to understand this. I don't want you to look at it from the perspective of for us. I'm talking about for you. Right? Didn't we just look at that passage in Psalms 139 where David is talking about how God formed him, knew him inwardly, how he knit him together. The Bible tells us that God knows the numbers of hairs on our head, that he has intimate knowledge of each of us as an individual. The Bible tells us that God knew your name before the foundations of the world. More than 13.8 years ago, God was expecting you. Let me give it to you from another perspective. Uh, how many parents do we have in the house? Oh, awesome, a lot of parents. For those of you who are not parents, you may not understand this, or you may. But here's what's interesting. From the time that parents find out that a baby is on the way, stuff starts to develop in them. From the time that they find out, whether by doctor or by stick, whichever way you find out, from the time you find out that you have conceived life, something starts growing on the inside of you. Yeah. And I'm not talking about the child. I'm talking about a sense of love for a developing human being. Yeah. Hasn't taken a breath, but you love the child. Not only that, but expectation builds. Not just simply the expectation of when this baby comes out, because I've been through this four times. <laughs> I know it well. Not just the expectation of when the baby arrives, but there begins to be expectations and hopes about the future yeah. of what this may be, baby may become, of what wisdom you could put into that child to how you could guide that child's life to how you could put as much love and guidance and wisdom into them that they would have lives that would turn out well. If this is how finite, limited human beings think about children they're expecting, how do you think about a God who has all knowledge and who was expecting you from before time began? Yeah. What do you think he's thinking about you? See, it's not a surprise for God that you're on the way. He's always known. Yeah, yeah, right. But because your timing fits his plan, he waits for the time that he set for you. But as he waits, he waits with expectation. Mm. So when I talk about the fact that God has always loved you, you need to understand this. You need to wrap your mind around this concept. You need to have a full understanding because I think it adds some value to your understanding of your own life. Think about the worst thing that anybody has ever said about you. Think about the worst thing you have ever thought about yourself and measure that up to more than 13.8 billion years of expectation of your life. For somebody to be waiting. <laughs> now we understand that God doesn't exist in time. And he also doesn't perceive time the way that we do. But I believe that God has established time. Because time creates reverence in us. So, for instance, the reason why Daniel calls God the ancient of days is because time creates reverence in us. We have a reverence for God because he is eternal. Yeah. Because he's ancient. This is why the term ancient of days is used. I think that understanding helps us to even understand a value about our own lives. Because if God has been waiting for billions of years, the New Testament word for hope in the Greek is a word elpis, E-L-P-I-S, elpis. And it doesn't mean hope in the same way that we generally use the word hope. We often hope for things that we're not sure of. We hope for things that we don't know is going to work out one way or the other. God forbid, I mean, if you, if you ever played the lottery, you are hoping you're going to win, right? 
We hope for things that we're unsure of. You go to a job interview and you're hoping you get the job. The challenge is the word hope in the New Testament scriptures, that Greek word elpis, is not defined in that way. It's not defined as something that you're not necessarily sure of. The hope that's spoken of in the New Testament scriptures, elpis, is an expectation, an anticipation. There's confidence attached to it. If God were to hope, and there's some theological debate about whether or not God hopes, because how can someone who knows all things hope for anything? Yeah. Right? Uh, and we also, but we also recognize that John says, all right, God is love. And then 1 Corinthians chapter 13 says, love always hopes. <laughs> he does use the same word, agape. Uh, I, don't, I don't know. Um, I don't know which of those is a greater truth, but what I do understand is this. Love would make sense of that. Again, if you're a parent, I've used this example before. If you're a parent and you have a son and you've raised your son right, you love your son, you've done the best you could. But your son begins to hang out with company that's not so great. Begins to get involved with people who are questionable and whose influence you're concerned about. You recognize that your son is getting involved with people whose character could corrupt his own. One day you get a phone call from the police. Your son is in jail because he committed a crime. And it's a bad crime. The first thing that pops in your mind is, he's been with these people. And surely their influence may have brought him to this place. But the next thing that pops up is your hope. It couldn't be my son. I raised my son properly. And your love kind of makes you conflicted now with some reality mixed with your personal feelings of hope and love. See, what I want to explain to you is that God loves us in a reckless fashion. Mm -hmm. yeah. Yeah, you're right. God loves us in a reckless fashion. How else do you explain giving your son's life for people who don't care about you at all? Yeah. 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 How else do you explain that? Yeah. What would you call that? <laughs> other than a reckless love. In fact, this is what Jesus is communicating when he gives us the parable about leaving the 99 sheep to go find the one. So we focus on going to find the one because the fact of the matter is the, the father or the, in this case the sheep herder or the owner of the sheep loves the sheep, doesn't want this sheep to be lost. Yeah. But the fact of the matter is, is he recklessly leaves the 99 yeah. to go find the one. Yeah. There is a reckless love. Um, some of you are familiar with how irrational love can make you. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Almost everybody in the room was like, yeah, like, we've all done something real dumb for love. Like, whether, whether it was the love of a loved one or whether it was the love of someone, we've all done some pretty irrational things that defy logic and wisdom. For the sake of love. I believe that the Lord has allowed our feelings and emotions to be so, so influential in us and love in particular so that we could understand his reckless love for us. See, the scriptures are saying to us, if he won't hold back his one and only son, if he won't even keep him from us then what wouldn't he do and what wouldn't he give for us? See, the fact of the matter is God has always loved us. I recently heard um, a pastor say that somebody, I guess this pastor may teach at, uh, teach at a, a, a theology school or something like that, and he says he has a class, and one of the gentlemen of his class came to him and said, you know, pastor, uh, last night I had a friend at my house. My friend came to my house, and my friend said that, God knew Adam and Eve would sin. 
and that God knew man would be launched into a sinful state and that he knew he would have to sacrifice Jesus to bring man back out of sin. And the guy says to the pastor, I just don't believe that. If God knew all of that, then why would he allow all of this heartache and pain from the time that Adam and Eve fall, from the time that Cain kills Abel, and everything else we've experienced throughout history, slavery, Holocaust, I mean, all of these things. If God knew from the very beginning that this is how things would go, why would he do it? And the answer is because he loves us. Because he loves us. Think about this. Jesus is the son of the living God. Lives his life without sin. God still requires his life of him as a penalty for sin. If Jesus couldn't be spared for the life of the world, why would the world be spared for the souls of those who could be saved? You hear that? I know you're, you're saying, say it again, Miriam. All right. <laughs> Miriam's going like this. Uh, if his son wouldn't be spared for the sake of the world, then why would the world be saved for the sake of those who need Jesus, who need to come to God? God has a reckless love for us that, exi that has existed since before time begins because God is the beginning of all time. And he has made a plan that included Adam and Eve's fall, that included the sacrifice of his son, that concludes in the eternal life for everybody who believes. Hallelujah. Because he loves us. Yeah. Amen? Because he loves us. And because he always has. See? Because he always has. And so I want you to just think about the value of your own life. Because this is, this, this is huge. I mean, think about anybody who may have ever said to you in your life that for some reason you were not valuable. Or that for some reason you weren't worth anything. Or that for some reason you wouldn't amount to anything. And then think about that from the lens of a God who loved you even before he laid the foundations of the world. Made specific plans about your life yeah. and the salvation of it. Yeah. Would God do that for someone who wasn't worth anything? Yeah. <laughs> that doesn't make sense. No, no. See, the fact that God has always loved you has these huge implications. And I think that you having an understanding of that, you being able to get to a place in a depth of knowledge where you understand that God has always loved you individually. In fact, if you go home and you repeat this to yourself, I don't want you to say that God has always loved us. That's true. But I need you to understand this. As much as the scriptures are about God and as much as the scriptures are about Jesus and as much as the scriptures are about the gospel, the scriptures are always also about you, about God's love for you. All of the rest of that, look, God, Jesus, the gospel, all of those things are communicated to us to help us understand how much he loves us. That's the point of it all. I, I, I See, I, I don't ever, I don't want any of you to ever have to think about yourself as anything less than what God sees of you. Yeah. I don't want you to entertain in your mind thoughts that somebody said something about you negative and that you're carrying that stuff with you throughout your life. Yeah. That stuff that people say in comparison to what God has said, yeah. nothing. Nothing. You think about the fact that the creator of the universe knew your name and loved you and waited with expectation. Yeah. Some of y'all don't know. Some of y'all are 90s babies. I came in 72. That's when I got here. <laughs> 72 is when I came on the scene. Afros and bell bottoms. 
what not? Oh. <laughs> Were high waters a part of the game? I was. <laughs> okay. <laughs> All right. Well, I, I wasn't up on fashion, and I was just a baby, so I just I'm gonna leave that alone. <laughs> <laughs> uh, my point is, as we, as we look at the human timeline, 72, whether you were born in the 80s, whether you were born in the 90s, all of that compared to the beginning of all time is nothing. Yeah. And that from the moment, and this is hard to understand because of where we are in our knowledge, but from the moment, that the decision to create the universe was conceived. God knew you and loved you then. Yeah. And he carried that love for you and the expectation behind it and the anticipation behind it until the day you showed up. That's a long time. And to think that he did that with this, with this hope that was a pleasant expectation. It says a lot about your value. Now, to be clear, and I'm going to close on this. To be clear, we have to recognize um, that we're created to serve God. We're created to worship God. Yeah. We're created to give him glory. We're not created to just run recklessly in our own conceits and vain pursuits. Yeah. We are created for him. Mm -hmm. But like someone ordering something that they really want on Amazon, he was waiting. Yeah. And he had a great expectation and still has a great expectation for your life if his very will and purpose for your life has been unfulfilled. See, where are you in your purpose with God? Where are you in the center of his will? There was a time in my life when we were in Durham just before, maybe a year or so before we would move here to plant this church. Um, driving one night to teach a class at church very little money in the bank <laughs> and uh, four little kids living in a very small house. Uh, we have four people, well, six of us, and the house was 1,200 square feet. Um, I was driving to teach a class, and as I was driving to teach that class, I was worshiping God, and this feeling came over me of just extreme contentment. And I realized that as I was on my way to teach that class, that I was actually in the center of God's will. Not because I was on my way to teach the class, but because of where I was in my life, what God was doing with me then and there, and where he was going to take me. Being in the center of God's will, that's where all of his expectation comes to a sense of fulfillment. Yeah, and it's the, it should be the place that you're aiming for, the center of his will for your life because he's always loved you and he's been expecting you and anticipating you since before time began. Bow your heads with me. I hope this message was a blessing to you, but I can't let you leave without talking to you about the ultimate blessing of life. And that blessing is to have all of your sins forgiven and to have a relationship with Jesus Christ. Romans 10 and 9 says all you have to do in order to have that relationship is to confess with your mouth and believe with your heart that Jesus Christ is Lord and that he's risen from the dead and that you will be saved. And so if that's you, then right now you can go before God. You can pray. The Bible says that if you confess your sins to him, that he is faithful to forgive you and he will forgive all of your sins. And then you can just simply ask Jesus to come into your life and be the Lord of your life. I'm telling you, there is no greater thing in all of life itself than to have a relationship with the creator of the universe through his son, Jesus Christ, who died on the cross for you.
So if you do that and you want some next steps, you want some guidance about where you may be able to find a local church in your area, simply send me an email, pastorron at designersway.org. Send us a message on the Designers Way Facebook page. Reach out to us in some way so that we can help to guide you in your next step if you made your commitment or making your commitment to God today. I pray that you will. God bless you. We'll see you next week. Designers Way.